Welcome back to another segment of Behind the Scenes of the Waltons. Today I'm joined by another special guest, Martha Nix, who played Serena Burton in season eight of The Waltons. This is a little bit different what we're going to cover today because uh, not only are we going to cover aspects of The Waltons, but uh, Martha has a lot of very uh, personal experiences, difficult times that she went through that she uh, is going to share with us. So please welcome. Martha Nix. Thanks for joining me. Absolutely. <laughs> so I was just uh, looking over uh, a bit of the sort of history of the uh, segments. You know, you did, you were, you were all throughout season eight. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, you and um, Keith, who went by Keith Mitchell at that point, now Keith Coogan, were Serena and Jeffrey Burton, Rose's grandchildren, and you came and first appeared in the episode, The Kinfolk. Yes. 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 So. <laughs> That's about, about all I remember. I'm <laughs> kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were, you were pretty young when you, when you started that. I was, um, it was right before I started seventh grade. Okay. Yeah, so I was tw probably 12, maybe 11. I was 11. I had my 12th birthday on set. Wow. And there's a funny story. Um, so it, I was in sixth grade when I had the audition and it was crazy hair day. And I had braids all over the place for crazy hair day. And then I get a call back and my mom was like totally horrified. I'm going to this period audition in the forties when my mom grew up. Um, and and I had to take out all of those crazy braids. And I had, and at the time I had totally straight hair. Um, this is a 1984 perm that never left. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. But, so when I was a kid, I had bone straight hair, except for this day. And I had all the kinks of all the braids that were in my hair. So we take out the braids on the drive from Orange County to LA, which is anywhere from an hour drive. And my mom the whole time is totally freaking out. Like I'm going to lose this opportunity on the Waltons because of my hair. And, but Earl Hamner found it absolutely hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping my acting had something to do with it, but definitely the braids made me st or the kinky hair made me stand out from all the other kid actors who were on their last audition for the show. So was, um, did you read with Jeffrey or with, you know, with a Jeffrey character with, or was it strictly Serena callbacks? Not that I recall. I think it was just Serena um, reading with the producers on that call. I don't even remember how many auditions I had up to that point. I just remember the randomness of crazy hair day. And Earl and I talked about it briefly in, um, in my adult life. And he said, oh, yeah, made you stand out. Uh, well, that that's cool. So you had been, how old were you when you started acting? How did that sort of come about? So I started at the age of four. Um, and the story is told that, you know, here I am, a toehead kid. Um, and people would stop us and say, um, your kid ought to be in commercials. And so... They got a list from um, Screen Actors Guild for agents. The first person they went to only took adults. The second one, um, he said, I don't do well with her type. Redheads are in it now, but I'll take a chance on her. So that was Don Schwartz. He was my agent for years. And um, I got the second job I went on. And again, it's kind of a funny story. Um, so when you go on these commercial audition there were back in the day there were tons upon tons of kids rooms full of actors and um it was the last audition and I go in and I say to the director want to see my chicken pox and I show my leg where I had all these bumps and the cast director bolted to the where all the other kids said, how dare you bring your child here and expose them all to chicken pox my mom's like that's not what it is. But do I have to tell you what I think it is? And she's like, yes. I, like, I think she's allergic to chocolate. <laughs> I had had my very first full chocolate bar on the previous audition, broke out everywhere. They hired me and two adult men, one to put a brown cardboard box under my mouth for me to spit it all out and the other fully clean my mouth. 
So, <laughs> always the story. <laughs> so this was a commercial for chocolate. chocolate. Chocolate candy bar, which is no longer in existence. Wow. Yeah. Probably because it's kids were allergic to it. it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, over time, they figured out I had just started school and I was, um, it was the sand fleas in the sandbox. Oh, wow. But everything happened all at once. So, yeah. Um, but that's how I started. And then I did commercials for a while. And then at the age of seven, I got my first television um, role on Days of Our Lives. And I was on that for three years. Um, I was supposed to be written out for three months. Um, and then they were going to bring me back because on the show, my biological mother had gotten custody of me, but then I was going to go back to my adopted family. But in between that three month period, they got rid of all of the writers and brought in a whole new group of writers who forgot about my character and what was supposed to happen. Aww. But if I, if all that had fallen into place, I wouldn't have been on the Walton. So it worked out. So you didn't mind that you did the Waltons instead? Um, the only reason I minded, um, I don't know if you had this experience. Um, for me, it was very difficult to go back to school, to mm. traditional school. Um, I was an outcast. Um, I couldn't make friends the normal way. And it's funny because now as I've gone to a couple of my high school reunions, people are like, oh, it was so cool. You're on TV. And it's like, they didn't act that way when I was coming back to school. So I loved working. Um, I always wanted to be on set. Um, I never wanted to be, let's call it a normal kid at school. It was just too hard. Um, and I loved working. Um, I mean, just think about it. You get to go to school three hours a day. Come on. <laughs> and you get to do all the other cool stuff as well. Yeah. I never felt like I'm I missed out, but unlike you, I didn't have consistent enough work prior to the Waltons where anybody particularly, I just miss a day of school here or there, and nobody really necessarily knew much about what was going on. So uh, until high school, when I was doing the series, that's when those three months I had to go back to public school in high school, and the series was, was in its first couple of seasons. That's when I started to experience that other aspect of it. Yeah. I, I was just in Indiana after our time together in Illinois mm. and I share with kids about, you know, I was bullied before bullied was popular. <laughs> Basically we didn't call it that. Um, and it was just, I told them that growing up, my name was Martha Midget Mud Pie. And, and there was a whole song attached to that, that they made up about me. And, um, because I remember being on the playground and they'd like make a mud pie literally and go eat it. And I'd be like, you know, and I had no, no, no for so long. And then one day I was like, well, not eating it didn't create friends. So one day I ate it and then the song came about and all I wanted to do was work. I wanted to be out of Orange County in LA um, on set because I mean, the Waltons is a unique cast in the sense of um, you all have remained tight knit mm -hmm. the, ho the whole time and, and have folded us in, you know, even though I was just on for a year compared to your guys's long um, stint, I don't feel really any differently when we're together. Um, and, but most casts are not that way. Mm -hmm. You, you go on a show, you are family for a day, a week, a month, three years, and then everybody moves on. And most, I mean, like days of our lives, I don't, I don't keep in contact with anyone from the show. And I was on it longer than I was on the Waltons. Um, and the people who I had the honor of working with over the years is like amazing. And as a child actor, we're now in that stage of life where everyone whom we worked with, not everyone, but many of the people whom we worked with are passing away. And we watch fans just mourning their passing. And we felt like they were a member of our family mm -hmm. uh, during that week or 
year. Um, and it's just so different as a child actor to um, our realities are so unique. Yeah. So your experience on the Waltons, what what sorts of things do you remember? What stood out? For me, I and I've talked to Cammy and Keith about this. I mean, the biggest thing that stood out to me is our teacher, Glenn Woodmansey. Hmm. Um, he was so invested in our learning, but he did it in a creative manner. Hmm. Um, we had a hundred gallon salt water tank in our classroom. We had a, I think it was a 10 gallon fresh water and he would go into the ocean and go scuba diving for various creatures that were in there. And, and then we had a newspaper that we would publish and give it to all the cast and the crew. And um, he, he just made learning so engaging. It wasn't just writing papers and that it was creating a newspaper that everybody would read. Um, I remember for Halloween, we turned um, the, um, oh gosh, I can't remember their characters' names, the tw- sisters. The Baldwin sisters. Thank you. <laughs> the Baldwin sisters' house into our haunted house. <laughs> and then all the cast and crew could go through our, you know, mazes and that. Um, and then Keith, Cammy, and I, and Glenn, he had arranged something. We went to a, a bona fide haunted house. And we were these characters in there and we acted like mannequins and people from, they ha- they didn't realize who we were, but we were playing these characters and like they'd come up to us at touches and they'd scream that we were actually alive. Like they couldn't tell the difference. I mean, it was all these things were, that were not technically on set that were so memorable to me. And um, I mean, Cammie, I looked up to her, you know, and the, going to her house on the weekends and spending the night and um, just having these deep conversations because she was a high school student. I was a junior high student. Like, I loved that. I learned about the Beatles through Cammy. Um, I love the Beatles, but it's because of Cammy. Um, I hadn't been exposed to that um, because, again, you know, as an actor, I didn't do anything really but work or go on auditions. So I wasn't exposed to a lot of the television and um, movies and music of the day. Um, My upbringing was totally different. Um, But I loved, um, especially being around Cam. Keith and I were closer in age and he was like a younger brother that I'd never had. and, you know, as I look back on it, every, every, this is how my 12-year-old wounded self felt. Um, I felt like everybody loved Keith and I couldn't like measure up to Keith. Um, you know, they'd always talk about Keith's scenes and how he stole the the scenes that he was in. And in, in school, he was just so uber smart. He remains uber smart. Um, and as adults, we just, you know, love one another and... Um, but as a, as now that that might not make sense to some people. So let me give a little backstory at the same time when I was doing the bulk of my work on days of our lives and on the Waltons, um, one of the reasons why, an additional reason why I didn't like coming home was, um, I was being sexually assaulted by my parents' best friend. So there was this whole another other wounded child, um, that was trying to seek um, acceptance and love and and hearing how much everybody loved Keith. And, it, and he was, he was a phenomenal actor. Um, it just hurt that wounded child who was looking for affirmation. And it had nothing to do with Keith. It was just me seeking purpose outside of what was happening behind closed doors. Did you share that with anyone at the at the studio or the set or Cammy or any of the ones you were close with? Not to the best of my knowledge. I don't believe I, sh- first of all, I don't think I truly understood what was happening. Mm-hmm. Um, I wasn't taught about that. Um, so I logged it as a child logs it. Mm-hmm. Um, I was taught to obey elders, do what I was told. And I did, especially as, I mean, that's how I think my parents would have taught me, even if I weren't a working actor, but it's amplified as a working actor. You get work for following directions. Mm -hmm. 
And I followed directions to a T. Yeah. And doing so, things that aren't always comfortable to do as an actor. Yeah. You know, I, I certainly experienced that as a young person. It's like, oh, I don't want to have to do this scene, but you do the yeah. scene because that was the job. Yeah. You had to kiss the guy who was picking his nose and zits at the same time <laughs> in school right before you had to do. Yeah. No, there's a lot. you did. <laughs> Or on the Waltons, the scene where there's this big bowl of mincemeat pie. Oh my gosh, that was horrible. I was, I had to eat and I just couldn't eat men's sweet pie. And I was like, cut, 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 cut. And they, the guys would just keep the shot going, just waiting for me to take a bite. And I just couldn't do it. <laughs> but you're right. We did have to do things we didn't necessarily want to do. So, I mean, I was a perfect target in that, but I just didn't at all have the language. Wow. To- Okay, what was happening? Yeah, well, I'm so yeah. sorry that was happening and that none of us knew to be able to help. Yeah, there's no way of, you know, there have been people um, who in my adult life, because of what I do, I have a nonprofit that we started out as um, helping people who have been victims of sexual assault and doing everything in our power to stop the pandemic of um, sexually abusing um, children. Um, We do a lot of education to prevent sexual assault. Um, But because I'm fully open about what happened to me, I've had people come to me, um, especially someone who's in the industry and he goes, I never could put my finger on it, but now it all makes sense. Mm. Um, Because he too was a victim of sexual assault as a child, but now it was one of those things that he wondered but he just dismissed it. It's not something you you want to believe is happening. Mm-hmm. Um, but there have been people in my adult life who have been like, now certain things make sense. Just, mm-hmm. you know, a vacancy in the eyes um, or, you know, a longing to fit in and just trying to break down these barriers of being accepted and fitting in. And that's where some of those dynamics of, you know, clinging on to this relationship with Cammy, where she wanted nothing in return. She just wanted to be, whether it be a friend or a mentor. And, and, and I, I've told Eric Scott, the story of we were in a scene together and I think it took place in the attic and Eric was kind of known for, um, how can I say this? Um, of messing up scenes. <laughs> And they had a count. And I thought to myself, if I could get that count, then I'll have purpose. And I didn't like, it's like, so like, do you realize how much you're costing the production company by screwing up scenes? But I just wanted to stand out. And like, I kept intentionally messing up a scene to try to get the recognition that like Eric got for being that fun guy and Keith got for being that person. I was just seeking so much um, in unhealthy ways or costly ways to create um, a name for myself, you know? And, and that was part of the pain of not coming back on the show is I had found a place um, where I had purpose as an actor, where I had, um, an incredible learning environment with um, Glenn and um, Cammie and Keith and, you know, different actors who would come on the show. And it was just such a fun place to be with Dukes of Hazards right next to us. And um, we just had a a fun working environment. Yeah. Um, And and you had some fun storylines. I mean, we probably didn't interact as much because my character wasn't necessarily around the house as much at that point in the series, but, um, but you were around when we were, when we were doing different things, like, like the horse race, you know, where you were sort of, you know, around there, or, you know, when you were getting your Girl Scout badges or something, or. And that's what most people's favorite episode is. Mm. Because you were teaching me first aid, correct? Yeah. And. Every and and come on, I just shared with you. I was t- struggling with Keith, so to be able to fully mummify Keith, <laughs> that's fun. 
I love that episode. Um, and but you you were the one in that teaching me, helping me get that badge. Mm-hmm. And um, but a lot of people will tell me that was their favorite episode that I was in where I wrapped Keith fully up head to toe. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I, I'm glad that it was a a good working and and I mean, it was more than a working environment for us. It was it was home, you know, in Absolutely. so many ways. Yeah. And that's the, I mean, work is a very, um, it was our work. We did go to work, but we wrapped so much more living into um, the time we were together. And as a, as a child actor, the unique part is you're on set every day, even if you don't have a scene. Right. And um, so I was there every day. And in and on those days when you don't have to shoot a scene, you're banking more school. And so we only had to, if I remember correctly, legally do 20 minutes of school a day if we had a full work schedule. Yeah, I don't even know. There were some times I don't even know that we got that. You know, I, I, I remember those really, really heavy episodes where you just didn't get it, but... You know, maybe it was if we did school, it had to be in 20 minute. Increments. Exactly. They wouldn't count it if it was less than 20 minutes. Earlier in the series, there were times where, you know, you'd go and you'd sit down, you'd be there 10 minutes, they'd call you back out or 15 minutes. And finally, it was, it was I think, one of the teachers earlier on who said, we're just not going to count it if it's less than 20 minutes. So any number of times during during an episode, you might go in and only, and several times do only 10 minutes for only 15 minutes. And none of that counted because you didn't get anything done. So I was like, what is the point? So I I would feel like I don't even want to go back to school because I know they're going to call me right back in. So I'd want (laughs) want to hang out. I didn't want to have to go to school. (laughs) It was quite the place to hang out. So when I was on Days of Our Lives, um, all the prop guys taught me how to play backgammon. And my going away gift was this wicker bad gammon set and then I went on the Waltons and there was gaming going on but not bad gammon it was our drivers and they taught me how to play poker and gin <laughs> <laughs> so I became a good poker and gin player back it was more gin than I than poker uh, but our drivers um, were a lot of fun <laughs> yeah I remember the yeah the transportation room where they because they would if we weren't moving or something didn't need to be taken someplace, they just had to hang out until something was needed. And so they would, yeah, pass the time by playing cards. (laughs) It was great. And another one of my memories is Bill Reynolds, Uh the makeup guy. He was just such a nice man. And I remember talking to him a lot in the makeup room. My memories are really like kind of, different than most people because I'm was 11 and 12 years old. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of, you didn't, you didn't really, Michael was more or less gone. Michael learned it by the time. She was there, but not a lot. Yeah. Somehow I knew Michael um, and Will was already gone. Yeah. And Richard was gone. Uh, Ralph, I know John was Boy there. too. Yeah, the new John Boy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it was. It's an. It was an interesting season because it was the season after Michael had more or less left. So although she may have been, she was. She may have been back or around at times, but um, you know. And then Ralph sort of being the only sort of parent figure around. So then I stepped into some of that as well as of course, Peggy. And, and did you, did you have a chance to get very close to Peggy? I always loved Peggy. She was so sweet. Peggy and I were, um, we stayed connected over the years. Um, she's just a special woman. She, I mean, she's not, her personality's enough like aunt Rose of that endearing part, but then there's nothing like Aunt Rose at the same time. Um, And and remember she was going back and forth between Dukes of Hazzards and the Walton set, (laughs) uh, 
which it was very convenient. But um, yeah, yeah, even after the show was over, she at the time um, that we reconnected, she would call me her little missionary because I was going overseas and and working and and she supported me on some of my trips to go um, work on the streets with street kids. Um, my daughter's favorite stuffed animal growing up was something that Peggy gave her. It was a white and black dog. Um, and um, I was at her service. And um, I don't know that most people know Peggy's career started back when she was on I Love Lucy. Mm. She worked and worked and worked and worked, but kind of went under the radar for so many. So the role of Aunt Rose really was one where people could identify with her, which made her feel um, a unique kind of special because she was normally what we would call a B actor. She'd come into a guest role. And then, she, you know, after um, the Waltons, she started landing more of those iconic roles um, like um, on Dukes of Hazards. And then afterwards, Grace Under Fire, I think the name was of the show, the comedy that she did. Hmm. But those longer term roles happened af after the Waltons. Um, but she is just such a special person mm. and kind hearted, hardworking. Yeah. Uh, always just, upbeat. Always. Oh, always, always. Joy to have around. Yeah. Wonderful sense of humor. Kind. <laughs> yeah. Just so easy to be around and to work with and so talented. And I loved the relationship between that they built between her and Stanley William Shallard, who was also an actor. William was such worker. a nice man. Yeah. And so funny. So funny. <laughs> the last time I saw William, we met at Denny's in downtown LA. <laughs> well. And he's he was just an unassuming, again, hardworking actor. Yeah. But just such a good person. And um yeah, I think yeah. a lot of those sort of journeyman actors that were never big, big stars, but just worked all the time, they they were just such wonderful people. You know, they just they just got on with it and were always a pleasure to have on the set. There was no no drama, no ego. You know, they just Exactly. Yeah. Just did it. And he'd had tremendous success in his career, but was never a big, big star, you know, there is a very small echelon of those people that become major stars. Yeah. And we were so fortunate. I mean, even the year that I was on to have such quality actors, um, like Tony Becker joined the cast while I was on. And oh. just and again, I don't know if, you know, the people who were in the casting department could see beyond the script or how we read the script in auditions mm -hmm. and see solid, humble people. Mm -hmm. Because it just seemed like those are the actors that would come and work with us. They, they didn't hire people who thought they were all that. Yeah. Um, or maybe they did and they were quickly gone. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> My husband, um, when we've done certain Walton events and, and with, and t when Tony's been there, I mean, my husband and Tony just hit it off and he is just a hoot, but he's a hardworking guy. You know, the last time we were, saw him, he was a roofer. I mean, he would do these amazing roles, and, but knew that he had to work hard to provide for his family. Yeah. And that's, that's the type of person that was on the Waltons is they did what had to be done um, on set and then even off set. That's what I have for you for this part of my conversation with Martha Nix. I'll be back with more that Martha had to share about her life and her experiences in Hollywood. Until then, thanks for watching.